I want to pray again before we actually start. Father of heaven, we are so thankful for this record, for the scriptures. We're thankful for godly men throughout the history have made record of these things by inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We are thankful that you've given us such a vast salvation to look into, that it's full of detail. We love the detail of your salvation. We should expect this from a God who knows all things and sees all things, a God who's infinite in his wisdom, whose power excels all without bounds. We are so thankful that, Father, you have worked a salvation that is God-honoring. So, Father, we pray that you would bless us, give us strength, help us to end this day on a high note with a strong faith in beholding what you have to say about this showbread. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, brethren, I feel like everybody has in some way said what I wanted to say today. And I, I, I suppose that's a good thing because, I, you know, each thing in this tabernacle is kind of a complete picture in and of itself. You could take the entirety of salvation and look at it from the perspective of light and you'd have a complete picture, just like Brother Ernest showed us. Or you could come over here from this other perspective and look at it from the perspective of the sacrifice and the distinction between righteousness and what's sinful and wicked, and, and you'd have a pretty full picture. Or you can look at it from the perspective, I'm going to look at it today, from the perspective of life and death and living unto God and being aware of God, and you would, in a sense, have a pretty good, pretty good full picture of the work of salvation. And that's what showbread is about. It's about life. This is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he might give life <laughs> to as many as you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. He who has the Son has life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So this is a central focus in the work of salvation is the impartation of life. When sin came into the world, death came with sin. And death dominated over the entire race. The thing that men need more than anything else from God is something that they can't get up for themselves through any kind of procedure or method or law, they need life. And if you're going to approach unto God and not just come to God, because it's more than just approaching to God, it's about living in the presence of God. Amen. See, we're in that sense, we're kind of unlike the priest. They had to come in, go out, come in and go out. You know, I think some people are more like this kind of old covenant religion. They come in, go out, come in, go out, come in, go out. I think they're coming in. I really don't know for sure if they're coming in or not. This bread went in and stayed in. And it never went out. It was consumed in the holy place. Because if you're going to live unto God, you've got to do it through the life which God supplies. Amen. And that, my brethren is what showbread is all about. It's what it's all about. Now this is unfortunately something I've learned from Babylon, and if you don't know what Babylon is, Babylon's the false church. It's people that say they know God and they don't. It's a spirit that is moving throughout all churches of our age. It's teaching people the same thing that the Jews did with the, with the ceremonial procedure. They come to God with their lips that their hearts are far removed. And the fear of God is taught by the precept of men rather than by a consciousness toward the living God. 
They came before him by a rope. Maybe they did what he told them to do, technically, but they disobeyed it in the spirit. And God said, I, I am not pleased with this at all. You can't serve God by routine. I'm like, I'm like still shaking this out of my garment. This corrupted idea that you can come before God by a rule and a routine. It doesn't work that way. There's got to be life. And this showbread is about the nature and manner of spiritual life. We should expect that from bread, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm going to highlight this morning. Now, there are so many details about the showbread. In fact, since the brother have already talked so much about details, I'm going to go ahead and just say this. There are so many details about the showbread because if you're going to live before God, you're going to have to do it on a detail level. Yeah. Generalities are killing people. Yeah. God loves everybody. God's great. Well, tell me why he's great. Tell me about his law. What do you know about it? And then you find out it's a lot of people just kind of dry out right there. They don't have anything to say. But I'll tell you right now, if you're going to live fervently before God, you're going to have to do it on a detailed level. You can't do it with generalities, which means you're going to have to know something about God. You're going to have to know something about God. Brethren, the first thing you'll see about the showbread right away is that it was prepared. And since, brethren, I've already said something about it, I'm just going to hit this and move right on. Thank you, brethren, for doing that. I can get to some other things. It was prepared. You didn't take grain and put it on the table. In fact, you better not try and bring anything into God's holy place that hasn't been processed and prepared. I assure you, he will not receive it. Brother Matt, he already brought up this, and I was going to say this too, brother, because growing up as a young kid, I thought it was that way. I thought it rained down bread from heaven in loaves, you know, and they just kind of picked it up and ate it. But if it was that way, then why would they say, what's this? You know? Maybe they were like a lot of church members. Maybe they thought God was just going to make it easy. He's going to rain down bread. And so they said, well, what is this? I didn't know we'd have to work. It was like a coriander seed. It was something that was made visible after the dew evaporated from the ground, which means you better, if you're going to serve God, you've got to start early, brother. And don't try and wait till the middle of the day to try and start getting bread from God. The door of heaven might be closed. Get it early. But they had to get the, the seed, gather it all up. It was on the ground. Gather it all up. Grind it all up. And if it was showbread, as Sister Tasha mentioned, it had to be fine ground flour. And then they had to mix it together into dough, but you can't plop the dough on the table. It's got to be cooked and prepared. In fact, one of the great details of this that I love is it had to be at the hot level when you brought it into the whole place. You can't bring it out of the oven, so to speak, and then let it kind of cool off like we do. You know, you kind of let it kind of cool off so we can eat it. This wasn't for you. This is for God. It's got to be at its hot level when you bring it in. See, there's so many details in this. I just, I glory, I glory in the showbread. If you're going to come to God, you've got to be prepared. You've got to be prepared. As the scripture has clearly said, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord. Who shall stand in his whole, holy place? Well, who will, brethren? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord. Well, that just ruled out every one of you. Every one of you just got ruled out. Because God has developed by 4,500 years of forbearance, forbearance on God's part. Long suffering. It was not easy for God to bear with an ungodly world for 4,500 years. But that's how long it took to teach men 
that there's not one among you that's righteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. None. So how in the world is an unholy people going to stand before a holy God? They shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of their salvation. They're going to have to be prepared. Now think of that just as it relates to their life. And I just want to kind of move on because I really just wanted to hit this detail because there's so many things to see. This detail of preparation. If you're going to live before God, you can't have a single sin sticking to you. This is something you don't get in this contemporary church world. They talk too much about people living in sin, and yet they've got a good heart, and they really love God. If you've got one sin sticking to you, you're going to die. You're going to die. You can't live before God with a single sin. It's got to be pure bread, ground bread, holy bread, processed, prepared bread, before you can even get into this holy place. You've got to be right. Well, you are. In Christ Jesus, the new man, the new creation is created after the image of him that created him. Righteous and holy God. The new man. That's who lives in this holy place. Okay? But thank God for that preparation, brethren. Because between the time of your unholiness and preparation, as Brother Bob said, mercy was right there in the middle. Yeah. God could have killed you right there and have been right with one sin sticking to you, as has already been said this morning, let alone the multitude of sins that every one of us, each of us, has committed. That means God wanted to save you. Amen. He made the preparation. Let's move on from that. that. But that's really good. Now, another thing to see about this is that the bread wasn't in the outer court. It was in the holy place. That's where it was. It wasn't in the holiest place. It wasn't there. It was in the holy place. You're not in the holiest place yet. You're going to be. You're going to be. A day is coming when God's going to dwell with his people. He'll be their God. They shall be his people. See, in unrestricted glory. Huh? We'll be in his presence. We'll follow the lamb whithersoever he goes. But you can't get there now or you die. And yet you're not out in the outer court, brethren. You're not out there where all the defilement is. You're not there. You know, some churches leave you there. All they ever talk about is labor and sacrifice. They never get beyond that. They kind of leave you there. They don't realize that forgiveness is so that you can enter into the holy place. Right? I think the reformers could go a little further here. Let's get beyond justification and realize what eternal life is about. It's about the glorious life, eternal life, that we now have in Christ Jesus. We're in the holy place. And you know, everybody that is in his sanctuary talks of his glory. Amen. Psalm 29, 9 says that. You see, God is the main figure in the holy place. In fact, everything that's in the tabernacle service entirely only has significance as it relates to God himself. If there is no God, there's no need for a sacrifice. If there is no God, who cares about washing? We don't need to wash. If there is no God, then who needs bread to sustain life? And who needs illumination? We'll just walk around in ignorance like the heathen and the ungodly are. The sacrifice is significant because God's holy. The mercy seat is significant because God's merciful. The incense is significant because if you're going to come to God, you come through Christ. See, in the sanctuary, it's about God. And if we've talked about details, but we haven't understood God, you've missed the entire point. It's about God. That's what it's about. And now, brethren, you just happen to be in the place, in, the, in this holy place where now you're coming to learn about God. You're finding more and more that everything's about God. You wake up thinking about God. You meditate on his law day and night. What's happening? You're living in the holy place. Yeah. You know, some people haven't gotten here yet. That's why they're always talking about other things. They're never talking about God. It's like they haven't quite got here yet. Let's help them to get there. Yeah. The sanctuary is about living unto God. And I'll, get more, I'll, I'll speak more about that here in just a little bit. Now, it's important to understand that there was a table. The showbread wasn't thrown on the ground. 
He didn't bring it in the sanctuary and just kind of throw it on the ground. We're civilized people in Christ Jesus. It's not like that. We're not beasts. We used to be beasts. We used to think like a beast. We're not like that anymore. It's on a table. And not just any kind of table. A table made of a K of wood. It's about three foot. It's not a big table, you know. Three foot, one and a half foot. It's about just over my knee. Two foot and about three inches. Just enough room for bread. And made of pure gold. Of course, you know, you never mingle unholy things with holy things. If it's holy bread, it better be on a pure table. I'll get to that here in just a little bit. But here's something to see right away. Spiritual life is an elevated life. If you're going to be sustained, you're going to have to get off the earth. Amen. The bread, brethren, God will not toss the show bread onto the ground. If we're living in the dust of the earth, then you just go hungry. If you want to live, you're going to have to get up on the table. You're going to have to get away from the world. See, that's the idea you have there. It's a marvelous depiction. And those who are living in heavenly places, what a marvelous advantage they have, see, because they're living in the place where the bread's elevated. The sustenance is, is in a heavenly place, is in an elevated place that's pure and holy and right. Amen. What an advantage you have having been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, brethren. Amen. Right? You're elevated so that you can eat. Amen. Eat. So I encourage you to do that, brethren. I encourage you to do that. So there we have the table. Another thing that you'll notice about the showbread is that it was a marvelous representation of the consecrated people of God. And they were a consecrated people. Right from the beginning of the service, all the people were sprinkled with the blood. It's as if God is saying, and you are now my people. You have been cleansed and sanctified. You're not going to be like any other people in all the world. You're going to be a holy people. You're my people. And here's something else I'm going to tell you. Whenever you bring the showbread in, you're going to make 12 cakes. And you're going to make two rows, six cakes in each row, because each cake was a marvelous representation of God's detailed focus on his people. He saw them not only conglomerately as the people of God, but as individual 12 tribes. When the people of God went into Canaan, they dispersed. They went into different places throughout Canaan. They didn't all just like dwell in one acre of land. Well, you couldn't do that with that many people, but... But they spread out. But no matter where they spread out, they were always had in remembrance before God at this table. When you put the showbread on the table, it's 12 loaves, and it's to be there for me to behold. Always before my presence. And thus it came up with the name presence bread. It's been called that. Jewish people call it presence bread. Because it has a depiction of God's eye beholding his people. The Lord knows them that are his. Maybe the church can't think beyond the four walls of their own building. But when God looks at his people, he sees them in heaven and on earth and all throughout the world, brethren. The Lord knows them that are his. I'll tell you, that's a great comfort to you. Sometimes you won't feel like God. Sometimes it doesn't feel like God knows you or sees you. Sometimes God hides himself. Go back to this showbread. God's not indifferent to his people. His eye is always beholding them. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are open unto their cry. That's our God for you. Always upon his people. Even back as early as Job, we find this word written. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous. Not even for a moment. Never does. Because if he did, you'd be in big trouble. His eyes are always beholding his people. Can a mother, can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget and they are today. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. 
So in other words, another way of saying when God works, he works on behalf and behest of his people. Amen. All things that he does with his hands, he does in remembrance of his people. Not in remembrance of the world, in remembrance of his people. I understand he gave his son for the world, but his preferential love and treatment is toward his people. He doesn't write the names of the world on his palms. He writes the names of his people on the palms. And the bread that was in the holy place was a depiction of the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel. How much more so... Is God's eye on you whose name is written in heaven? Amen. His eyes on you. Brethren, this is a very important thing to see. You can go through a lot of things when you know God's eyes on you. Amen. Huh? He said, when you're in the fire, where's God going to be? Where's he going to be? With you. When you go through the water, it's not going to overflow you. Why? Because he's going to be with you. His eye always beholds you. You will every day get into circumstances that are way beyond your ability to negotiate. But they aren't beyond his ability. His eye is always on his people. It is. Never took the showbread out of the holy place. That, that's, well, that's just wonderful. That's, thank God for that. That's marvelous. Now, I want to get more specifically into this, this spiritual life more, and more of some of the details that we have here. Jesus said eternal life is knowing God, not just knowing about God. It's not just having facts in your head, although you've got to know things about God. I mean, you can't walk before God if you're ignorant. But it's more than just facts. It's reality. It's walking with God. It's walking in a consciousness of God. Remember he told Abraham, walk before me in fear. <laughs> I'm your God. That is, you live in awareness of me. That is to say that your daily conversation becomes the product of your knowledge of the living God. That's when you're walking before God. If we have to like say, well, God reigns in heaven and he knows everything you're doing and that somehow adjusts what you're doing, this is not God honoring. That's not living before God, brother. Those adjustments are already in place because we're already living under God. This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, the things that I'm going to say now, I'm going to tell you, this is what spiritual life is. This isn't what it ought to be. This is what it is. Okay? We're not going to theorize on this. This is something that you have to judge for yourself. And I'm not going to assume that you're just, you're, well, it's just something that you have to judge for yourself. This isn't theoretical. This is the way spiritual life is. Jesus said, a good tree bears good fruit. It cannot bear evil fruit. Spiritual life's like a good tree. It bears good fruit. So here's the first point. Spiritual life is a holy life. It's a righteous life. When you bake the showbread, ground it fine. You remember when David came to the priest he was running, really, for his life, but came to the priest to get bread for his men. They were hungry, didn't have anything, no food, no resources. And remember what the priest said? He said, there is no common bread here. All there is is the show bread. You remember what the priest said? Have the men been with women? Has there been unrighteousness? Because you are not, you are not, going to mingle holy bread with unrighteous people. All that is here is hallowed bread. And David said the men haven't been with women for three days. If they had, God have killed them while they were eating it. That's really what would have happened. Remember Jesus referred to this event a little later. He says they, he actually went against the law and taken the bread and yet he kept the spirit of the law because it was about holiness. That's what it was about. You have been created in righteousness and true holiness. Jesus came unto his own, and they received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he right to become the sons of God. Not they that were born after the will of man, not born after the will of flesh, but of God. 
created in righteousness and true holiness. And John echoes his first gospel in 1 John when he said, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Why not? Because this life consists of fine flour. It's a hallowed life. And it's lived in a holy place. Brethren, you have a holy life. Don't let anyone tell you different. We got too many preachers talking about unrighteousness and unholiness. I understand we have flesh. I understand we have that. But we also have new life. And there's not a bit of defilement in it. And he's actually made a separation between soul and spirit. So there's no defilement taking place in the true you and the new you. It's completely holy and righteous without defilement. Hmm? That's what it is. Brethren, you'll find as you grow in this life, because all these are things we grow in. I'm not standing up here to be a legalistic. All of us are growing in these areas. But as you grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, there are some things you find out. First off, that he's made unto us righteousness. The more you grow in Christ, the more right you become. I mean, not, not, well, that's not the best way of putting it. The more you are able to have your senses exercised to discern between good and evil and to refuse the evil and choose the good. You're right from the get-go. I understand that. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Right? What is that? That's new life. That's holy life. And when you have new life from God, you're able to live holy before God. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Hey, you can do that. You can keep that. You can. It's a holy life. Now, there's a danger here, and I just want to highlight this. <clears throat> there's a danger, brethren, of mingling holy with unholy. Yes. We talked about this. Seems like this has come up in, in, in a lot of sermons already so far of mingling holy with unholy. All of the things associated with that showbread were pure holy things. The table was made of gold. All the instruments were made of pure gold. The bread itself was made of pure flour. It was in a place that had been consecrated that was holy. The light candlestick was holy. Everything associated with it is holy. It's all holy. Why is it that way? Because for a holy life to be sustained, there can't be unholiness mingled with it. Can't be. Because at the point unholy mingles with holy, guess what happens? Holy is no longer holy. Okay? Let me give you an instruction a very detailed instruction that was given to the priest in Ezekiel 44. It's a little lengthy, but I'm going to make a point here, so just bear with me. Ezekiel 44, 17 and 23 says, It shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates, that's these priests, okay, the sons of Zadok, these priests, they enter in at the gates of the inner court. They're coming in to the sanctuary where God dwells. They shall be clothed with linen garments. And no wool shall come upon them. While they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. So right away, I wear a cotton shirt with my shirts. If I have a polyester shirt on, I'll wear a cotton shirt underneath because you sweat in a polyester shirt. That's what happens. But if I went into the holy place with this, I'd be killed. You don't mingle threads. Not if you're coming into the holy place. When you come in, you come in in pure linen. Don't add wool to it. Hmm? A very important detail. Is our God detailed? You bet he is. They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads and shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. And when they go forth into the utter court, even into the utter court to the people, they shall put off their garments where they ministered and lay them in the holy chambers and they shall put on other garments and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. Holy garments stayed in the holy place. If you sweat in them, you're dead. 
That's all there was to it. See, brethren, you've got to be careful. There cannot be a drop of worldly secretion joined with holy life. Can't happen. You suppose it could be on that detail of a level? Well, this isn't so bad. This isn't that sinful. It's not as bad as so-and-so. Is it a drop of sweat? Hey, if you're going to live in the holy place, you better not be sweating worldly sweat. Huh? Yes, better not be joining worldly wisdom with the things of God. Better not do this. That life won't sustain it. It just won't happen. You will not be sustained like that. Neither shall they shave their heads nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. In another place, he told them, don't you be cutting your hair like the worldly people. You are not to mingle holy with unholy. Don't you even desire to look like them. Don't want what they have. Do not mix holy with unholy. Now, brother, and we've seen through the scriptures what happens when men try to mix holy with holy. Achan tried to mix holy with unholy, remember? Took of the, they took of the spoils of the ungodly. He thought, well, this isn't that big deal. It's just one Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, wedge of gold. Nobody will ever know. And a lot of people in the camp of Israel died because of what he did. What was wrong? He was holy unto God. And he had no right coveting what was of the world. And none of us do either. This is the master stroke, shall we say, as Brother Jeremy says, of Babylonish religion. It is an attempt to mingle holy and unholy. It's in the music. It's in the worship. It's in their understanding. It's in their doctrine. It's in everything. It's an attempt to mingle holy with unholy. But at what point you do this, life begins to degenerate. Hmm? That's what happens. You'll forget that you were purged from your former sins. That's what will happen. You become desensitized. Any time a child of God has grown insensitive to God, I'm pretty sure you can trace it back to some point where there was an attempt to mingle holy and unholy. I'm not going to make rules on this because this is an area, this is something between you and God. But I assure you, it's on a detailed level. And this is something that's worked out between you and God, but brother, you've been made to live in holy places. You've got a holy life. Let's live there. Spiritual life is also a consecrated life. You can't live before God on Sunday and then live for yourself on Monday. It doesn't work that way. Amen. I was always shocked at this. I mean, that we could get in a great service and great preaching going on and this, this it's just now gotten over and people are on the earth already. What is going on here? People trying to live compartmentalized. They live for God supposedly on Sunday and they live for themselves the rest of the week. They're, well, you don't know how busy I am and I've got so much to do. you got more to do than God does? Your schedule is defined by what he says. Right? Yes. See, it's a consecrated life. At some point, and I know this is something we grow in, but at some point, everybody's got to get to the point to where you're living for one thing only. Amen. This one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after all the days of my life. One thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it shall not be taken from her. You can either live each day world and troubled and bothered about many things, or you can live for one thing. You want to live for one thing. Which means, brethren, everything you do and say, you do to the glory of God. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Amen. It's a consecrated life. See, this bread, it stayed in this holy place. Its entire definition was about the holy place. It never got out. This wasn't common bread. You couldn't take it out and do what you wanted with it. You're that bread. And you can't live like common folk. you got to live in here. Amen. Now, there's one great thing about this. and I know that this could be preached from Mount Sinai, and i, I got to be careful of that. But let me tell you one thing about this life that is so remarkable. Spiritual life is a provided life and a satisfying life. Everything you need for life and godliness is had 
in the holy place. There's light there. There's protection from the world. I love that. Brother Mike, no windows. Yes. What a wonderful thing. And the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This marvelous protection. I love it. And there's bread there. That's where you do your eating. See, everything you need for life and godliness is in that holy place. God didn't have any of it out in the unholy place. He did nothing in the, nothing out there where the Gentiles had defiled the outer courts you need. I understand Christ sacrificed there and you washed there, but it's so that you could get in here. But everything you need is in here. Everything. And it's a satisfying life. Thou wilt show me the fountain of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You know, I'm the most satisfied when I'm the most conscious of the living God. And the most aware of him. It really is exceedingly satisfying to live before God. Thou wilt make them to drink of the rivers of thy pleasures. Jesus said... He'd give you bread to eat to where you wouldn't hunger or thirst again. That's how satisfying it is. So I'll tell you, it, it is a marvelous thing to live in this holy place. Now, I just wanted to end with these, with these remarks. Because this is obviously a very high calling. What God has called us to is not something you can do in the energy of the flesh, not by any means. But here's the marvelous thing. All these things that we've said about spiritual life are things that Christ produces in you. He is the life. Preeminently, Jesus himself is the showbread. He's the bread of life that has come down from heaven to give life to the world. Amen. And he that eats of his flesh and drinks of his blood has eternal life. Yes. And if you abide in me and I abide in you, yeah. you'll bear much fruit. Well, that's everything we've said. Well, I'll tell you, you can either do it the hard way or you can do it Jesus' way. I've done it the hard way for a while. You think you can just kind of self-will and you watch some, I'm just going to imitate them and just kind of do what they do and I'm just going to do this in the energy of the flesh. Oh, it will not work. It will not work. You see, you grow in this life to the degree that you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and abide with him. He actually produces the fruit in you as you abide in him. That's what this life is about. That's what him being the bread of life is all about. The scripture says in Romans 7, 4, that we've been married to another way that we might bring forth fruit unto God. You've been married to Christ, productive. And the truth of the matter is, brethren, if you really, what a lot of life is about, Brother Matt had brought this up about, about a lot of our bread resources are spent in fighting the wicked one, but really what a lot of this is about is getting rid of the obstacles that block your fellowship with Christ. Yeah. Removing the, and this is something every day, you've got to die daily to do this, or this isn't going to happen. It's like the bread that rained every morning. I'll tell you, if you didn't work it over, you just didn't get sustenance. And there's no satisfaction in eating on coriander type of seeds. I can assure you of that. It took work. But if you'll remove the obstacles, and this is a lot of this is between you and God and you're in your fellowship with him, but if you get what's out, get what's is presented as a blockade by the wicked one, get it out of the way. Jesus will produce this fruit in you. Amen. We've Amen. seen it. Amen. We've seen it. And people that have been serious about seeking Christ Jesus, he's producing this fruit in you. Amen. That's the sense in which this labor is easy. And the burden is light. Here you are in the glorious presence of God Almighty. You're glorying in some great truth. And while you're doing that, you're eating. And you're getting strength. And you're able to discern more between what's evil and good. And your resolution toward what's right increases. Like Brother Aaron has said, all of a sudden you don't, you don't really fear men. And you don't really want the world. In your new man, I'm saying. This is living. So I encourage you, brethren, Christ is the only one that can produce this fruit in us. He's the only one that can do this. You cannot do this apart from Christ Jesus. This is what brings glory to God and to Christ. It's a work that only God and Christ can work in you. So, brethren, this, the exhortation seems pretty obvious. Look unto Jesus and live. Thank you, brethren.